Thanks, everybody, for joining in. You're listening to News Channel 3's Community Conversations. It's a series of podcast episodes that feature Michiganders talking about issues that matter to you. And in this episode, the News Channel 3 uh, weather team discusses our mild winter season and also looks ahead at what the spring might bring. And, of course, that's what everybody wants to know because people sometimes correlate or think that there's a correlation between a mild spring and maybe it gives us some predictive, or mild winter rather, and gives us some predictive power for the spring and the summer. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but it is something I think that's on everybody's mind. So, um, you know, mild winter indeed, not a lot of snow, warmer temperatures, really didn't have a lot of cold air. When you think about uh, several years ago when we had what, of course, some people are referred to as the polar vortex, <laughs> winter, however you want to refer to that, extremely cold weather that we had, but we had triple digit snow. I think the entire month of February was so very, very cold uh, with a lot of sub-freezing days. This year, by contrast, really on the other end of the spectrum. And um, wondering, of course, is it done? I know the vernal equinox is uh, this coming Saturday, uh, but usually old man winter has a surprise for us. Maybe not this time around. Maybe we're just going to get away uh, pretty easy. Uh, what do you think? Well, Keith, I think it's funny. I just want to touch on what you said. It's so funny. I feel like that's the most common comment I get um, from people when we have mild winter. It's like, oh, this means spring is going to be so bad. You know, everybody seems to think that way. And there's not, like you were saying, Keith, while it sometimes can happen that way, there's not necessarily a direct correlation with mild winter translates to brutal, cold, snowy spring or early spring. So I thought that was a <laughs> kind of funny mention for sure. Yeah, I mean, I know it's not officially spring just yet, but I was just looking at some of the high temperatures for uh, the month of March so far in, in Kalamazoo. We already had a four day run of 60s on the 8th, 9th, 10th and the 11th. Uh, on the 10th, we almost hit 70. Uh, it's not unusual to maybe see a day around 70 or so uh, occasionally in March, but um, I think the fact that we're um, sort of this early into quote-unquote spring-like weather, and we have so little snow on the ground, essentially save for maybe some of the bigger piles at the, the grocery stores, like that's, that's really a win. Like that's a big thing. It's huge. And we typically don't get that 70, uh, first 70 until what, April and May. So the fact that we were that close, as you mentioned on the 10th, and that was a record high for us is certainly saying something. It was uh, it was a little breezy that day. That's the only, I remember it being warm, but I also remember it being a little breezy. It's like you can never get them both to happen, the warmth and no wind at the same time. So we'll work on that as we move forward. <laughs> you know, we talk about, we don't have predictive power necessarily, say for the mild winter and even this sort of mild start to the month of March, or it's not really a start anymore, um, we're in it. Uh, but one thing it does make me think about is severe weather potential. Because, you know, as long as we're hanging out in the 30s and 40s, um, you know, I don't have any concern, of course, about really any kind of severe weather. But when we start having days up in the upper 50s and certainly 60s and getting close to 70, that to me sort of flips the switch on the possibility for severe weather, which, of course, it's very early for us for this time of year. But obviously, we've seen it getting off to a rock and start in the south. And I think, you know, some of that warm air that's sort of uh, advecting into our area here over the last few days. I just wonder if it's going to set the table for us uh, and maybe set a tone for us um, for an earlier severe weather season uh, to get sort of maybe moving a little bit earlier than we're accustomed to. Yeah, in 60s and 70s at this time of the year or into April is a lot more concerning because it's just kind of that, that transitional time of year where you have more ingredients in play potentially for severe weather. Um, and certainly as we get into May and start to really warm up, we see more of that. But um, I wanted to really quickly, you guys, just touch on, again, kind of recapping winter, um, the season snowfall. Some really, I mean, it's been just a insanely quiet year in terms of snow here in West Michigan. There were a few lake effect events, I know, in parts of like Van Buren, Allegan County that were pretty substantial as would be expected, but at least from what we've measured in Kalamazoo, we, we take daily measurements at, at News Channel 3. We keep our own records, records that we have that go back 30 years. So what's kind of cool, Keith and everybody else is, you know, through those records, we have our own little climatology, right, of things that 
um, <clears throat> keeping track of. And so far this season, we've measured just barely over 30 inches at News Channel 3, which is just crazy. Um, you know, based on my calculations, you guys, I was looking at all the, the monthly averages that I've calculated for everything that we've measured. And, you know, at this point in the season, we should be at at least like 61, 62 inches. So we're like pushing, you know, we're, we're at like 30 inches below average, which is just pretty crazy. And, and that kind of cross checks with Grand Rapids as well. Um, you know, the National Weather Service up there, they're saying that their season snowfall as of um, when we're recording this, the, I guess, 16th, technically yesterday, 45.8 inches. And that's a difference of about two feet below average. So, I mean, and that's I think, crazy. I think we feel like ripped off too, because I know Jeff, your family's from uh, southeastern Pennsylvania ish, and they got these massive nor'easters that dumped, you know, 30 inches of snow all at once. I think that happened twice. Um, and then we just barely make it to 30 here in Kalamazoo. Uh, it doesn't give us any bragging rights. I'm sure, Jeff, you can speak to that. Yeah, the thing is, um, we didn't really have a, a, a robust winter last season. Like, last season was around 44 inches, um, you know, in Kalamazoo. Unless something crazy happens in the final two weeks of March, we'll probably make it through the month without any measurable snow, at least from what I can tell, going out to, like, the 28th. But, I mean, you came off of last winter thinking, oh, my gosh, we are going to get slammed this year. and it just never happened. And what was, I think, so interesting and sort of set the table for the entire winter was, you know, very little snow in November, very little snow in December. So we were already going into the season. You know, Keith, I know you know this based on all your experience here is we had a, a heck of a deficit before, you know, the calendar flipped over to 2021. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, you know, I, I think I know that Will and I have had this discussion before that, um, especially with us having 30 years of handwritten records anyway in the weather office. Um, I think that there are some maybe not so subtle trends that maybe are going on here. Um, you know, it's, if you look back, I believe if you look back like the last 10 years, I think that only one of those 10 years has had above average snowfall um, or even has reached average. I believe we've looked at those numbers before and with, with that one triple digit year, um, other than that, I don't think we've gotten, if you want to say that our climatological average is in the low 70s, um, we haven't had outside of that one year, uh, I think in the last 10, nine of those 10 have been below average. And I, I know that Will and I have talked about this. I wonder if our average is not what it was. Yeah, I think I'm very curious to see, you know, they're updating, the National Weather Service is updating their 30-year climatology this year. I think that's actually going to be going out very soon. So um, basically, we've been using 1981 to 2010, and now it's going to go 1990 to 2020, right? That's the thought. So I'm curious to see, you know, if, if we see that reflected in the the most extensive data set we have here in in, Cal, in in the Kalamazoo in West Michigan area is Grand Rapids. So I'm curious to see if the Grand Rapids averages um, reflect that change. I wouldn't be shocked if they did at least a little um, based on what you were just saying, Keith. And you know what else is just fascinating? Christina, I messaged you saying like, check those handwritten notes because you're the one at the station right now. Fit five inches on February 15th, at least in Kalamazoo. That was like our heaviest snow of the year, which is like right. <laughs> and I, I responded, and I'm looking through them. And I'm like, there's got to be one that's more than five inches. Uh, and the last line of my text to you was just LOL, LOL, LOL. Like, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, crazy. We've seen, I mean, last year, we had a few more events, like a few events, I think, higher than that. It wasn't many, obviously, because last year was really lackluster in terms of snow, too. But, I mean, that, that could be the difference, too. We just didn't see those really heavy multi-day snow events. We did see a few multi-day snow events, but it was like two, three inches, nothing that crazy. Yeah, and really, if you, you look at the science behind why, uh, it's all about the jet or, or two jets, right? We had like a split flow all winter. So the Northern branch was north of us for a lot of the winter and the Southern branch was more active, uh, not necessarily active for us, but active along you know the Southeast coast. So we were left sort of in between 
And that's that's the chief reason why, uh, you know, we didn't have as many systems or as many opportunities. And the other thing is, and I don't know if this is just, uh, you know, situational or recent, but I think all of us would agree that, you know, in a warmer environment, the poles are warming more rapidly than the rest of the earth. So when you get these chunks of Arctic air to come down from, from the North Pole, they're not quite as harsh as maybe they would have been 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point, you know, and, and I also think that, you, you know, it's, it's funny. I think if it wasn't for last year being so meager as well, um, I think it would be easier to chalk this up to uh, the La Nina pattern because to me, it favors that split flow. It favors, I think anyway, historically, more often than not, it favors a more active Southern stream um, where we actually end up missing out on it. Um, but this is coming on the back of last year. And so it makes me wonder, like, what's at play here? Um, because, okay, if you want to ascribe what happened this year, and like Christine <clears throat> mentioned, there's so many storms. You know, Cincinnati got slammed. Obviously, the mountains of West Virginia, Southeast PA, even Pittsburgh, certainly the East Coast. While we're just sitting here getting hardly anything, um, that to me is sort of like, okay, La Nina, let's say maybe. But what about last year? You know, um, I, it's just very interesting to me to try to think like, what, what is at play here? What, what's the bigger picture? Yeah, and one thing that is beneficial to the lack of snow this season slash lack of precipitation. One thing I found interesting, by the way, guys, is that um, Grand Rapids in terms of total liquid equivalent precip, they weren't that behind in terms of an average, um, only about three tenths of an inch. Whereas Kalamazoo, when you look at the recordings from the airport, um, was almost two inches below average. So that's kind of interesting too. That suggests that maybe kind of that I-96 corridor this season, I think we did see that. They got more snow than the I-94 corridor. And so I think that's reflected in the precip. Um, but what is beneficial to that below average wintertime snow and liquid equivalent um, is that, you know, that's going to be good news, hopefully, for this spring and summer in terms of our flood risk. And that's another big thing we wanted to talk about. But um, the fact that our, our snowpack in the last two to three weeks had a fairly gradual melting, that's really helpful. And a, and a, a lot different from the last couple of years where we had still some decent rain, um, kind of when that snow was starting to melt. And uh, that's what obviously... Keith and Jeff, you guys were here for the historic flooding um, 2018. Um, and I mean, you know all about that, obviously. Yeah, you know, and it's not the lack of snowpack. Uh, it's also the fact that the, you know, the couple of inches of the ground, the first couple of inches of the ground, I've already like thought, you know, so it's not like we're, we're melting or we would have been melting on like, frozen hard pack and then all that stuff runs right into the rivers that's not the case this year either so we're sort of far ahead with all of those things that you'd want to take care of before you get into our spring rainstorms and, and thunderstorms and, and so forth so i mean keith we've had plenty of winters and christina i'm sure you remember the first time you were at channel three where we've had plenty of winters where you know we'd still go into april we still had snow on the ground and that's that's an issue or a potential issue for you know, our spring flooding events. Yeah. And we're almost like scarred, you know, from that <laughs> because you don't, you don't want to put all of your dice. I don't know what I was going to say. You don't want to put all of your marbles. There we go into warm weather because you know that it happens still in April, you get some snow uh, going through April, but I will say, Hey, those potholes don't look as bad this year because of that gradual warming that we had and it didn't, you know, lead to those terrible roadways. So that's another sort of benefit of um, it not being so cold and snowy. There's so many facets, I think, to that as well. Some of them beneficial, some of them not. You know, as Will mentioned, also those river levels. I think he did a story in the last week or two about that, about how the river levels are um, very comfortably down. And so because it was really harsh three years ago, that flooding there along the Kalamazoo was, was really harsh. And, you know, I think what Jeff mentioned there is important to remember a key ingredient in that was that we had had some cold air that had set the ground for, I mean, it was frozen. 
And so then when we did pick up that precipitation, it wasn't really just melting snow. It was that fact that everything, rain that came down, anything that came down, it had nowhere to go but the rivers. And it's such a different scene right now. And, you know, you talk about, I know that we've done some stories about the lake levels. I was in South Haven a couple of weeks ago and just sort of, you know, took a walk down uh, River Street there, you know, down by the Black River. And, um, you know, it, it does look like, at least right now anyway, there's at least a little bit of breathing space between the level, the water level there and the municipal pier. Um, and so I, you know, hopefully that will translate into something that, you know, will be beneficial as well. You know, I talked to the assistant drain commissioner there for Kalamazoo uh, County uh, three years ago doing flood stories. And I remember them, then he telling me that we were going to, he felt like we were going to have to have like a year to two years of below average precipitation for things to come back down. Now, I don't know. I don't, he's not a hydrologist, um, but I think it's interesting to note that I think we have had a rather quiet precipitation period there. I think if you go back to last summer, it just seemed like it was just constantly wet around here. And, and we've had a break. And I think that, you know, not, not only in the rivers, but in the lake levels, hopefully that's been really beneficial. Yeah, and I think in the latest drought monitor too, I think we're now under abnormally dry conditions, um, which that'll get updated here soon. But, you know, that's something else to just note that we've been so dry that we are, officially abnormally dry on the on the drought monitor and um, you know everything that took place a few years ago and just the really abnormally wet period from really 2018 through parts of 2020 I know there was I'm trying to remember the time period but I know we in Michigan like Michigan area wide I think set like the record for the wettest one year period and I can't remember the exact time frame of that I remember reporting on it um, may have been like spring 2018 through like winter or like spring slash winter of 2019. I can't remember, but um, you know, all of that water eventually goes into Lake Michigan. Everything that falls in these river valleys in our area goes into Lake Michigan. And so that's why we had the record high water levels last summer, because it was this like build up on Lake Michigan. Well, now, interestingly enough, Lake Michigan is down about 10 inches from last March. So that's a good sign. Um, it's down about two inches from February. So it kind of is showing you, you know, a, about a month's time, it's going down maybe a couple inches due to the recent dry weather. Um, but that being said, as Keith, you said, you know, there's maybe a little bit of breathing room on that marina. You got to remember last year it was underwater. So a little breathing room is, is better than underwater, obviously, but we're still running um, well above average, about two feet above average on Lake Michigan in terms of that lake level for March. So it's not to say that this year will be like a, a quote unquote normal year on Lake Michigan or in some of those river mouths um, in terms of flooding and wave action and things like that. But it's a it's a refreshing change, obviously, from the last couple of years where, I mean, record high water levels have been a, a big story. I just know anecdotally, uh... Anecdotally, my sister and I were at Oval Beach in Saugatuck last July, and um, there was like no beach. There was like nowhere to lay on the beach. You've got, you know, a very, very small sliver of, of a beach, and then you've got, um, you know, dunes, and particularly in Saugatuck. So, like, that's an issue. Like, where are you going to lay down? Like, where are you going to put your towel and an umbrella and that, and that kind of thing? So, um, and what is happening right now with the Rex? And is he trying to get a drink? I just, this is amazing. I'm sorry. Sorry, so but I couldn't help it. Number one, he just had his nails trimmed, which he does not enjoy, but he is very good about it. Uh, we are Steeler fans here, so I'll reference that. But uh, he just wants to knock it over. He's actually here. Come here. If you're oh my God. For this and not watching, you got to go, go watch the video version because you will see Rex. How cute. Yeah, I just saw this paw. It seemed like he wanted to steal it away. Well, yeah. mission accomplished. We walked, we knocked over the water. But uh, just so the people know, Will, so when you say Lake Michigan is down 10 inches year to year, that's the Army Corps of Engineers, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the Army Corps of Engineers, they have um, a team of hydrologists and they have different instrumentation across all of the Great Lakes Basin. and. Um, they have different uh, reports that go out each week. 
And so if you're ever interested, you can always look that up um, online and it's all public source. A um, lot of fascinating data you can pull from that. And also they put out forecasts. Um, they update forecasts, I think weekly. And then uh, they have, you know, six month outlooks as well. So I know this year they're projecting, that's kind of what I was uh, putting in, in my notes here was that they're projecting, I believe us to be basically down about a, a foot at this summer's peak, which usually happens around July or August in terms of lake level. And that's typical just because of spring precipitation and early summer precipitation being a more wet time of the year relative to the winter in terms of liquid. Which is so nice because I know you've done a lot of stories on this, Will, but having people, tourists, um, people who don't know about the higher lake levels walking out on the pier and all it takes is that a two foot, you know, wave action to to crest over the pier and, and make things dangerous and slippery. So um, any any lowering of the lake is is really great, especially when it comes to summertime when we have a lot of people that don't know about it around. Mm -hmm. For sure. you know, a couple of things about that too, um, you know, talking about our weak winter, I also think that, you know, even if you go back to November, I know that with the, with the high water levels that we had, let's say going into October um, and, you know, the fall of last year, I really sort of was dreading, but I thought, you know, we're going to have a series of strong storms that are going to, you know, um, that are going to basically cause more flooding. And when I think back on it, I mean, we didn't have that either. I mean, that was another sort of aspect or facet of our relatively weak winter, we didn't really have any 50, 60 mile per hour wind events, you know, with a powerful low, let's say diving down out of Canada and sweeping across the Great Lakes that would have churned up Lake Michigan. Um, I don't really even remember us having any, I don't want to say any at all because I have a, a horrible memory, but you know, those are come with high wind warnings or um, and, and, and then of course with lake flood advisories, you know, we were doing those with repetition back in the summer last year, you know, and I don't, we haven't, and I, and I know part of it's, of course, it iced over a little bit, but not a lot. And we haven't had any of those because everything has been so relatively weak. And, you know, talking about what Jeff said on Oval Beach there, um, I had a, um, sorry, I've got somebody who wants to compete here as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated with the computer keyboard. He always is. Um, but anyway, um, I, I had somebody send me a picture from 18 years ago, um, and they are standing on North Beach um, with a newborn. And it's a, a, a man, his wife, the mom, dad, and they are standing below n the North Pier. Okay, I'm sorry. This is sort of distracting me. The North, but you know what I'm talking about, the North Pier? They are standing on the beach. Okay, um, with the pier up here, and they're not wet. And that was a sign of just how low the water level was. That was in the summer of 2002. And to, I mean, it's just so different out there right now with the beach that was gone last summer. You throw on top of that, that water um, control system, the flood control uh, barrels that South Haven has set up on South Beach, there's nowhere to go. So hopefully that will, you know, like on Oval Beach, um, on South, you know, in South Haven, South Beach, hopefully there'll be a little bit more beach for the folks this year. Yeah. And if you're curious, those barriers, um, I did some reporting on that. What's interesting about that people might not realize is that city of South Haven has one of their biggest um, water treatment facilities right there on South Beach. So if you're looking at that building that's right there, um, that provides a lot of uh, the city water storage um, and it's they actually have big tanks I think it's under like the north or the south side of the south beach parking lot they have actually like water storage under there and so uh, that was what they were really concerned about was if if we get flooding and erosion taking place that could kind of um, jeopardize the city infrastructure there and so I'm curious to see if those will I'm, I would imagine probably keep them at least maybe one more year just given that we're still pretty darn high but I'm curious because I know I'm sure they would love to get them get rid of them because they just kind of you know they're for lack of a better term they're just kind of ugly <laughs> sitting there right um, and it kind of takes away from the lake view if you're out on the parking lot when you have this row of barriers um, but anyways it's an interesting story.
do we want to uh, do we want to look ahead as far as we can go anyway? Do we want to kind of pivot and, and see what we see in our meteorological crystal ball for uh, you know the next couple of weeks and beyond? I was going to say that, Jeff. You took the words out of my mouth. I'm sorry. No, no. That, yeah, I, I think we should. What do you guys think? I would say you, you guys go first. You guys go first. I want to go last on this one. Nose goes? <laughs> no. Okay, so from what I can tell is uh, at least through the end of the month, we look warm. You know, um, we've got 60s probably in tow for the end of the weekend, uh, at least through the mid part of next week. And then if you look at sort of the, you know, sort of global pattern for the end of the month, we, we stay warm. So no more cold air outbreaks, very few chances for snow. I know we have one tomorrow, which would be the 18th. If you're going to look back and listen to this, you know, well ahead into the future, uh, the 18th of March, but snow essentially off the table for the rest of the month. Um, and, you know, then we start getting into April and we start looking into our, our friends at the Climate Prediction Center. And I know they've already released, you know, their thoughts for the, you know, 30, 60 and 90 day outlook. And Willie, you were saying it's, it's kind of rosy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad temperature wise. I know that towards the end of the month, they're favoring pretty high likelihood, like you were saying, Jeff, of warmer than average, and then maybe a slight favoring towards wet or wetter than average. Um, so we'll have to see how that pans out. Um, but like we said, you know, we're, we're in a good position in terms of soil moisture content and the ability to absorb some rain right now. So that's good. Um, I don't know. I, Christina, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think we can uh, officially put the uh, brush away in the scraper. I mean, we might have a couple more frost events. Again, if you're watching it during the weekend, then perhaps not. But uh, typically our last 32 degree day happens in early May. So you might still have to use it for the frost. But yeah, things look warmer. And just for some perspective for those who are watching, um, our average high temperature in May is in the lower 70s. So to be, you know, slightly above normal or above normal is saying something because it's, it's already pretty warm out there. Yeah. Keith, let me ask you this. Have you taken your, um, like, driveway yardsticks? Have you taken them out yet? Um, I have, as a matter of fact, you know, and it's funny in our neighborhood, um, there are those sticks up and I think, I think about stopping and telling people, it's not, I think you can take those down, you know, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I don't ever want to go out too far on a limb, but it's looking more and more like those sticks, uh, should definitely, you know, be coming down. I, I don't think this is necessarily going out on a limb here. So on a prediction, but I will say, I sort of feel like, again, this is anecdotally. I don't, there's no, I don't have any numbers to back this up. It seems to me like we have three choices on severe weather season. And this isn't like rocket science here, but it seems to me we either have an active early season, we either have an active late season, or we don't have an active season at all, which I think has been the case really for the last few years. We haven't really had a lot of action, but it just seems to me that, you know, either it gets off to an early start, maybe like mid to late March even, and through April, but then it's tempered. And I think that's because we've made that transition into the warmer pattern and there's not that, you know, clash of the air masses that's really going on anymore. Or when we have, it seems to me, a colder spring, then that is sort of delayed until like May and June, which I think climatologically speaking still, I think from the SPC, our time for severe weather is more late May and early June. But it seems to me like with this warm start that we have here, and like Jeff had mentioned, looking for the rest of the month, it doesn't look like it's going to reverse course. I just wonder if that's also going to set us up for maybe some early severe weather to where we might be talking about, you know, thunderstorm watch, thunderstorm warnings um, in April, whereas, you know, typically, you know, maybe it's late May and June. I, to me, what I hope anyway, if we could make a, a, a prayer to Mother Nature, is like, look, whatever we get, just give us one dose of it. So that we have it, if we're going to have it, we have it like in April, but then we're done by early June um, and that we don't have two doses of it. But I guess if I had to make a prediction, I would say that, you know, I have no way to back this up, by the way. <laughs> That's a good way to start a prediction. There's no science to this. There's nothing to back it up. But that we'll have, um, we'll have an active severe weather season in April and early May. Yeah, and just really quick, just kind of wrap up. I know... I was just looking into the La Nina, El Nino conditions. 
La Nina conditions are still on um, in the equatorial Pacific, which means like slightly cooler than average ocean temperatures in the Eastern equatorial Pacific. And what that translates to a lot of times in spring, at least from some of the studies and things I was finding online is that um, your upper level jet is a little bit farther north than a La Nina, uh, the opposite of that um, spring. And so what that can mean is a little bit more active of a severe weather season, especially out <laughs> actually uh, down in like Dixie Alley and, and parts of the South, like Mississippi, Alabama, uh, parts of Louisiana, which is what we're seeing uh, already a lot. And then it'll eventually kind of shift into the plains. But yeah, so I think it's definitely something we'll have to, I, I think this year could be a little, I mean, this isn't saying much, Keith, like you were just saying the last couple of years of severe weather have been so mu like quiet for the most part. We've only had a couple of severe weather events, but it could be a little bit more active of a year based on, on that. So we'll have to be on guard as we always are. One thing before we wrap up, I do want to note that it was at this time last year, or I'm sorry, this time uh, nine years ago, it was uh, middle to end of March where we had the wildest uh, weather pattern that I've ever seen in my years at News Channel 3. And that is when we had that run of 80 degree temperatures. I think we had nine straight record highs. I know GR on one day, I think hit the mid eighties. And to me, the most amazing weather fact um, is that the average high temperature in March of 2012 was warmer than the average high temperature in April of 2012, um, which is just, to me, it's just wild. And so um, I, it was at this time nine years ago, Jeff, you were here. So um, you remember, I mean, and it was just every day was not just warm, but the next day got warmer and the next day got warmer. And it, what it did too, is it set the apple farms up, the apple crop up for disaster because it was warm enough for long enough to bring out those blossoms. And I believe that it was 98%, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think there was 98% loss of the apple crop uh, in Michigan, which is the fourth largest producer of apples um, in the country. It was a disaster. Um, so I didn't want to let our podcast go here without um, recalling that, Jeff. I, I know you remember it well as well. I'm sure you were playing some golf on um, those afternoons. Yeah, I mean, it, and that really set us up for a drought. It was, it was a very, very dry summer. And I think, you know, for us moving forward, we'll have to start, start looking at the, the fire watches and the fire outlooks because we're already dry. So you get windy conditions and, and that starts to, you know, be the spark that, that could cause some problems. So yeah, Keith, I mean, that March was incredible. I mean. Yep. And I think that did set that, that we also, I believe, I believe it was the hottest summer on record, 2012. I know the first two weeks of July in 2012, our average high was hotter, was warmer, higher than Orlando. I, rem I remember these things because this is just, it was so, I can't remember what I ate yesterday, but I can remember those things because that was just so astounding. And so I, again, I, you know, I just wanted to bring that up before we close. Anybody else have any closing thoughts, by the way? No, I was just gonna say, I remember working in St. Louis that summer and you think it was hot in Michigan. It was oh, yeah. even more. And I just remember literally feeling like I was baking outside. It was horrible. I remember that. All right, everybody. Well, I guess that's going to wrap it up. I want to say thanks, of course, to the crew here, to uh, Jeff, uh, to uh, Will and Christina for taking time for our chat here. You've been listening to News Channel 3's Community Conversation. That's our series of podcast episodes here where we talk about all things Michigan, in this case, Michigan weather, not only the winter that we're coming off of, but what might be ahead for the spring and the summer. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.